or we aspire to foster responsible and value-based leadership. And I'm seeing many, many leaders um, here um, in the area of cities, urban planning, architecture, civil society, um, lots of thinkers, policy makers, decision makers, um, and a lot of creative heads. And these are the people, you are the people who we want to bring together. And um, it is so fun to see you in life and in color and not just on a screen to see that you are actually three dimensional instead of one dimensional or two dimensional and that you uh, uh, have more than a head and shoulders. It's really nice to see all of you um, here on, on the ground. Um, our Future Cities project is a, is a new project which we are just starting at the Aspen Institute um, in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, we decided that we wanted to do this because the, the cities have always been a hub for innovation, but they are facing huge challenges. And I don't have to tell you these challenges, climate uh, induced challenges, um, heat, cold, energy, um, health, pandemics, social, education, um, huge challenges, but at the same time also very big opportunities. Right. Um, if we do the planning right, uh, if we um, if we do the architecture right, if you if we design the space right, um, if we have the money, um, if we have the right people, and it can be a very rocky road. Um, and this is, I would say, a pivotal point of time. And if we don't make the right decisions, we might set up infrastructure, which is not fit for the future, which is not just for our societies. And this is um, why we want to bring transatlantic experts together, because we think we can learn from each other um, across the Atlantic, not just uh, the good projects, but also learning from mistakes. Um, so don't feel shy also to point out what we did wrong um, so that we don't repeat mistakes um, of the past. Um, we want to build a network. Um, we want to um, share best practices and worst practices. And we also want to develop uh, policy recommendations, um, which we want to present to the cities we live in today and, um, and in the future. And they would not, I mean, the whole project wouldn't be possible without the support of the city of Berlin, but also the Lotto Foundation, who has supported us in the past, um, our big transatlantic conferences, for example, um, but is also supporting us in this project. You're sitting in a very interesting location today, and I'm not sure if all of you know the history, um, but the Backfabrik uh, is called so because of the reason, because it was actually a back fabric. Um, this is where huge baking machines stood and produced the rolls and, uh, and the bread um, for East Berlin. This very room you are sitting in um, had, uh, did not host those baking machines, but it is where ice cream was produced. Um, and mm, some of you might know uh, the brand uh, Moscow ice cream. So this is where it was produced. Um, I'm sorry that we don't have any for you today, but we do have some, uh, some drinks uh, afterwards. And then at the start of the millennium, that all changed and this became a hub, a hub for creative uh, thinking, creative industry, for startups, and that it is, uh, that's what it is uh, today. And it kind of shows what you can do and turn into if you put your mind to it and your creativity to it. Um, and it, well, brings us to the question we, are asked, we have to ask today, so how does the city of the future look like in which we want to live? And um, this is why we brought together Berlin, Los Angeles and Atlanta, bringing them today to, uh, to, together today. Um, and um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about our project, um, just join us also um, afterwards. There are two tracks. Um, one is our scenario process, where we bring together experts to develop a scenario according to a scenario methodology. Um, and then we have our public um, interaction track. This is what this is about today. <laughs> and in the end, um, we really want to develop policy recommendations on both of this. Now, I already talked too long. I'm already getting the sign from the team that I should now hand over um, to a very special guest um, of today who took the time in her very busy schedule of 
first Sitzungswoche after the summer break. And not only this, it is budgetary week, Haushaltswoche. So this is, this is wonderful that you are here today. Um, Hannah Steinmüller is well member of the German Bundestag for the Green Party, and she represents, you represent Berlin Mitte, and um, you sit in the Committee for Housing, Urban Development and Construction, and you are fighting every day for affordable and ecological housing and better tenant protection. And I'm sure you will tell us now how you fight for it um, and what you have in mind to make the city better. So thank you so much and give a big applause uh, to Mrs. Steinmüller. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I thought this one isn't working. However, I try this one. So thank you, Stormy. And I would all, I always wanted to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening in a row. So hello also from my side. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to uh, share my perspectives from Berlin. You already mentioned my district is Berlin Mitte, so it couldn't be more urban. Um, and I split my keynote in three parts. Uh, I would start with the challenges, uh, carry on with the solutions and end up with the best practices from Berlin. As a side note, I'm not working on all of that in the German Bundestag. It's in my view more on the local level, but still I thought it might be more interesting to you because in, on the uh, national level, it's always not really concrete. It's more like the general things. So, so let's start with the challenges. Where are we right now? Um, cities have been, are, and will remain a driver for exchange, for innovations, for hopes and conflicts. More people live in cities than in rural regions in the first decade of the 21st century. For the first time in history, more than 50% of the people worldwide lived in cities. And here in Germany, we already are at something like 75% of the people living in urban areas. So the advancing urbanization often stands for economic development, for progress and for freedoms. But, and now that's the but, we also have at least two challenges. The first one is the urbanization. Um, we have the an increase of migration to cities, and it's on one side a good si sign, but it puts our infrastructures and also our social cohesion to the test. Overheating housing markets, and you're all obviously from Berlin, so you know what I'm talking about, and rising rents in the inner cities are displacing people with low incomes to the outskirts of the city and promoting social segregation. It's a phenomena, phenomena we see quite a lot in Berlin. The densification of urban development leads to shrinking spaces for recreation and traffic clocks or streets. The second challenge, Stormy already mentioned, but it's still a, a huge challenge. That's, therefore, I will say it as well, climate crisis. Our cities and their inhabitants are major contributor to the climate crisis and to pollution. We see very clearly the future of our planet is largely determined by the eco capabilities of our urban areas. And currently we know our cities are not fit for the climate crisis. Quite likely you will talk about that later as well. So the uh, challenges are there again, the heavy rainfalls and the overwhelming of our wastewater uh, infrastructure. As you're from Berlin, you know that there is extreme water. Um, it also goes to the Spree, which we don't like. Um, the, he the heat waves are becoming increasingly difficult to endure. The dense development leads to less air uh, co corridors and the cooling wind cannot reach the streets. And the stone buildings and the asphalt on the ground store heat and release it only slowly at night. So we have these tropical nights, which is um, a problem for health, especially for young people and for elderly. So these are the challenges. You could list even more, but in my view, these are the main ones. And now the better part, what are the solutions? Yes, cities face major challenges, but the cities of the future can also be part of the solution, in my view. To do that, we have to transform our cities, 
not sometime in the future, but here and now. We all have the sustainable um, development goals by the UN, which says in number 11, urban development has a clear vision to make cities and communities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So that is the game, uh, the goal, and now how to do that. The first one is construction. Instead of constructing buildings from steel and concrete, we must finally achieve a turnaround in construction. Then again, I think you will talk about that later as well. With lofts made of wood, walls made of clay, or insulation made of hemp, we have the opportunity to turn buildings into CO2 or carbon dioxide sinks instead of drying up gray energy. Consideration of the entire life cycle of buildings must find its way into our architecture. I think architecture was your point of view. Um, and uh, so that we build buildings today that we won't be ashamed of in 2045. Second thing, green cities. Instead of creating heat clusters, we need to strengthen the climate resilience of cities and prepare ourselves um, to, for the effects of climate crisis. Once again, instead of asphalt and concrete desert, we need to unseal the ground and to pl plan urban structures that are resilient to extreme weather events. We can achieve this only by making the gray areas in our cities greener and leave more space for nature. We need more parks, more allies and trees, more green roofs and facades of urban gardening sites. More urban vegetation accessible to all means also more quality of life and environmental justice in our cities. And an example I especially like are fruit trees. It also is a benefit for all the inhabitants if you can just pick up the apple or the cherry. And there's also a concept of eatable cities, the Essbare Stadt, which is, in my view, also a solution. Third uh, part of the solution is mobility. Instead of being stuck in traffic jams every day, we must clear the way for mobility of the future. Mobility must become easier and better for everyone and remain affordable. In Germany, we just had the 9 euro ticket, which was quite a thing. Maybe we can think about that more. We need more and better infrastructures for bicycles and sharing services, and we need to make rail and public transport more attractive. We want to avoid traffic through more digitalization and through, through short distances in everyday life. Schools and daycare centers, green parks and sport fields, stores and workplaces should all be accessible as possible on foot. This uh, secures local supply, protects nature, and increases the quality of life once again. The third one, distribution of space. More space for bike lanes, I already said, more space for parks. Where should all the, of this space come for? I think the answer is, we need a real revolution, a transformation of way, the way we use the city, uh, the space in our cities. Instead of owning our car, but, and instead of owning our own backyard on our own parking lot, we need to ask ourselves, how can we share space more efficiently? How can we create neighborhoods where community spaces and communal areas take greater space and you have less private parking spots? How can we build homes intelligently to save space and keep our per capita living space from ever increasing? In the last years, it was increasing up to 15 square, 50 square meters per person. We cannot do this any further because then climate crisis will be there quite soon. Um, the architecture and urban planning of the future is thus even more centered on the community that is built for and on the building uh, and less on the buildings themselves. And then the last one, energy transition. Instead of con to continuity to fuel the climate crisis, we must pro promote the expansion of renewable energies in our cities 
in order to have an affordable, clean and secure energy supply. Instead of oil and gas heating, heat pumps and solar thermal energy will become the heating sources of tomorrow. Instead of building gas-fired power plants, our municipality utilities should invest in photovoltaics and wind power, maybe less in Berlin, but more in, in Brandenburg. I love the sparking of a, a roof covered with solar panels, and in my view, this is the future. There won't or there shouldn't be any roofs without solar panels in Berlin or any other city. The decentralized energy transition has another advantage. Everyone can participate. Whether it's building your own solar power, power, solar power system on your balcony or roof, participation in wind farms, or founding energy cooperatives that supply residential neighborhoods with energy, or citizens are part of the energy transition. So that was the overview. And now let's come to the best practices from Berlin. All these solutions I just mentioned are important for the future of our cities. And the good thing is they are not distant. They are happening right now here in Berlin. Many cities are already on their way. Berlin is one of them, and I want to show you a few examples how we are transforming the city. My first example is a wooden building. It's in Wedding, so in the north of my um, district where I was elected, and it was completed in 2018, primarily using wood from Germany and from Austria. A total of 37 cubic meters of wood was um, used. That sounds a lot, but this amount of wood has already grown back after only 19 minutes. That's at least what my team wrote. The housing project was initiated by a housing cooperative, uh, cooperative that not only built sustainable, but also focused on community and new ways of living. The residents in the building are able to decide together in advance how much common and how much private space they would like to have available. In addition, the new building has a, an area for dementia flat, share, uh, dementia flat sharing community, an apartment for refugees and a shelter for homeless. We need more of these projects in our city at the federal level which now I'm in, in, uh, in charge. We are therefore just launching a new timber construction strategy. What further solutions do we have in Berlin? The pop-up bike lanes. In the corona pandemic, our mo mobility has been limited. Many have avoided tra public transportation and switched to bicycles. In Berlin, we seized the opportunity to set up pop-up bike lanes with our districts creating nearly 25 kilometers of new bike lanes in just a few months. Mainly bike lanes have, um, many of these bike lanes have remained and are now becoming permanent symbols of a progressive change in transportation. Another example or a good example in uh, the field of transportation are Keats blocks making traffic not only more sustainable but reducing it overall is another goal of sustainable urban planning especially in areas where children's play and neighbors meet heat blocks so it's a small area of an urban part uh, can help us keep traffic out of our neighborhoods with these whole neighborhoods are closed to transit transiting traf traffic only residents, emergency vehicles, garbage collection, and delivery traffic has access. The streets and the kids box be belong to pedestrians, bicycles, and public transport. The car is only a guest. This concept comes from Barcelona. They, are, they call it super blocks. And in Berlin, we have by now more than 50 civil society groups which fight for these kids blocks. And at least in my district in Berlin Mitte, we have at least one and like something like 15 or 20 in planning. And now we come to the last good example. It's also, I'm very happy to talk about it because it's a hard project of mine. It's the Spreebath. 
Baden in der Spree. Local recreation saves traffic and makes a city more livable. Especially water in the city promises recreation and cooling, which is in um, heat crisis also a thing. Anyone who has access, anyone who has ever been to the Spree in Berlin Mitte knows that it's not known till now for being particularly clean. Today it's even green because Extinction Rebellion had a protest and put some color in it. So right now we have a green spree. A citizen's initiative in Berlin wants to change that. The Flussbad Berlin has set itself the goal of reactivating the Spree Canal as a valuable public space in the center of Berlin. By using natural filters in combination with structural modernization in some parts of the sewer system, parts of the Spree are becoming clean again and people will one day, I hope it's not too far away, will be able to swim there again, next to the um, Office for Foreign Affairs and the Humboldt Forum. So all the examples I mentioned are mainly driven by civil society, and that was, was one of the questions in, before. What's the role of civil society? I would say it's a driver for change, because administration in Berlin has good ideas, but still often very slow. In getting there, especially with the uh, example of Spreebad, there's still a long way to go with the administration so that we be, will be able to swim in Spree at some point. So to come to an end, there are many examples that show what the city of the future can look like. You can have a swimming, your, uh, easy tr public transport, bike lanes for everyone, more public space that are shared and secure. Of course, we cannot just, just stick to these lighthouse projects. We need to communicate successes, learn from mistakes. So I'm quite interested in the view from Atlanta and LA and share best practices. Cities and municipalities can play a prominent role in this because unlike federal policy, city administrations are very close to the real issues and they share the same challenges with many other cities and municipalities around the world. By the way, there's a meal and food program. They are, in my view, the only global network that is started by a municipality and still run by a municipality, and they share best practices and ideas on uh, local food and um, having local farming, the cooperation because between the urban area and the area around. So the meal and food program might be an interesting example. Global networking and transnational exchange can thus become the breeding ground of a genuine grassroots revolution for the sustainability and future viability of our cities. The city of the future is not just an emotionless network of buildings and streets, but a pulsating hive of vibrant neighborhood where community is created. Okay, I won't. So um, thank you so much uh, for these inspiring words. Um, it's, it's great to hear somebody from Berlin, um, but also being responsible for um, federal policy making. Um, and before we let you go, because we know that you do have to go eventually, um, I wanted to ask um, you a couple of questions. And the first one is, um, since you are working in the federal government, um, what are the framework conditions which the Bundestag can set to make it also easier for cities, municipalities to move a little faster? One of the main things we usually do is giving money. <laughs> so there are quite some, a lot of programs for um, urban development. For example, right now we have a project on resilient cities with a lot of money for greener cities. But for, or at least in Berlin, we often have the problem that there are not enough people within the administration who can run those projects programs so Berlin will not use the money given by the Bundestag or the uh, uh, the government because there are no people left to work on that so that's in my view one of the main problems that we lack um, experts to 
to do this in the administration. Thank you so much. Um, so more capacities also on a, on a person, person basis. Definitely. Yeah. We often have not a problem on money. There's quite some money around, but we often have a problem of implementation and then flex of people. Yeah. Would you have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Maybe three or five. I'm, oh, no, yeah. no, no, I was thinking, yeah, three, yeah. five minutes? No, three, three or five three. questions. Oh, okay, wow, um, this is more than um, I thought. Um, wonderful. Yeah. I'm so, not quite sure um, about your time schedule. I want. Well, it's, it's um, uh, the, the team is getting nervous if I'm getting off course, um, but I think we can, we, it's so I'll lovely to have you here. And um, just a couple of questions um, from, from the audience then. Um, who would like to jump in? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Timon Prince from Federal Chamber of German Architects, and thank you for your very contribution. Um, in Berlin, I'm always amazed of how strong the districts in Berlin are, so the Bezirke. Yes. And when you walk unter den Linden, you see half of the benches on the green and half on the benches on the sand, because there was a line of district in between, and they couldn't agree to have a common concept. So is there an idea, or can the federal government help to encourage a common concept, a common understanding, because you're absolutely right, there are pop-up bikeways in one district, and then abruptly end at the border of the district, and then we you have, have some to in Berlin Mitte as well. Exactly. Yeah. Is there something from the federal level you can do to, to help the districts to get more united? To be honest, no. <laughs> because um, there's the um, Bezirksverwaltungsgesetz and the AZG, is, which quite strictly says who's in charge of what. And I'm not very optimistic that there will be changes soon. It's not the task from the national government. And I'm also quite pessimistic about the local and um, government to do something on that. I see the problem. <clears throat> Do you have an idea, a goal, or a vision of what Berlin's population will be in 2050? In numbers or in? Yes. From a current 4 million or so. I, I'm not quite sure because I think there are different trends. One is urbanization, I just mentioned it, but then again, at least in my um, um, peer group, there are quite some people when they get children, they will move to the more uh, rural area. And I'm not quite sure whether all these trends I mentioned, um, whether they will help let the people here in the city, or for example, if we cannot like um, work on the rising rent prices, there might be even further segregation. So I'm it's up to 30 years from now, I wouldn't predict what we end up. Hi, Mary Helmick from the Transatlantic Climate Bridge. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you've mentioned several best practices from Berlin, which are quite impressive. Are there any challenges that the city faces where you would think you would really especially invite learning about best practices from other cities, particularly on the other side of the Atlantic? Mm. I would say main challenge is um, that it's often not driven by the majority. For example, these kids blocks, we have the rule, we only implement them when at least a thousand people um, sign the petition to make these kids blocks. But then again, it's not the, the majority of the people living there. So they are quite a lot of people who want to remain, who want to keep their parking spots. And I think we have a clear and a lively vision where to go to. And I, in my view, it, it will be a good future if we have more community space and less parking spots. And still, I'm not quite sure whether we're always successful in convincing people to go there. And um, yet, I think it's as a politician, it's my task to make the cities ready for um, climate change and to do the most that we, the climate crisis will not hit us as bad as it looks right now. But that is, I would say, the the challenge we have quite often. 
Jens Paul, I'm a lawyer and academic, and I have a question coordinating um, the responsibilities between uh, Bundesländer and federal government and even uh, Bezirke. It's about, um, you, you said that solar energy and other is very important, I fully agree, but the problem in practice is that you have uh, not coordinated legal frameworks. Um, for example, uh, if you want to do a solar panel at every uh, uh, roof in Berlin, who had would have great, great problems to fulfill it because, for example, monumental rules and leg legislation is against. Who is able to coordinate this cascade of responsibilities? I think the federal must do. I study social sciences at Humboldt University and in political science, there's a theory of muddling through. And I was always pretty frustrated when I learned it at university because it says it's nearly impossible because you have so many stakeholders, so many difficulties to have like a cohesive policy making. And as long as I'm in politics, I think he's right. So I'm not quite sure. I, I think I should say, well, yes, we will do that on federal level. But right now I'm not that positive about it because my, in my view, we have so many open tasks and it's pretty difficult to get everyone on the at the chair uh, at the desk and have like conversations on how to deal it so i guess we will still have muddling through sorry for that and i hope that it's good muddling through though with making we try our best I to be honest, I think most of the people are good in mind and still it's pretty complicated because we have local level, national level, everything between. We have so many stakeholders, it's basically pretty difficult to have this very straight way. It's, I think, more like, like a normal, uh, um, what is something written or something, yeah. And I guess it doesn't become easier with the time we live in, um, with no. the energy crisis, the gas crisis, um, the, the food crisis in part, the higher inflation. So there are um, so many topics on immediate issues on your desk, and then the long to medium and long term. And I hope that you do have the energy to do both. Um, to I try my best. <laughs> And with this, um, thank you so very, very much being here today. And I very much hope um, that the uh, Spree project is going to be finished. Uh, any, I mean, Visit them, they're called Flussbad Berlin. Flussbad Berlin, because it's um, very close to where we have our office. So I would be the first person to go there swimming there every morning, but not right now. I mean, <laughs> um, to be honest, right now it's like 90% of the time the water is clear enough. But we have like, if these extreme weathers, mm. then uh, it's very bad and way beyond the um, the limits. So you shouldn't swim at that days. The others, it's fine. I think I'm gonna wait. <laughs> Do so. Thank you so very, very much. Um, and give Hannah an, a big applause. So um, now my job would have been to announce um, our first speaker, um, from Atlanta. Unfortunately, he just uh, called in five minutes ago um, telling us that because of a personal crisis, um, he can't join us today. Um, so, but we will hear from Atlanta at a later uh, point, uh, just uh, not from Matthew uh, Betzel. Um, and with this, um, we are turning immediately to hearing from our colleagues um, from Los Angeles. And it is uh, so lovely welcoming Erin um, today, um, live um, and in color um, from Los Angeles. And Erin is not only the director of, um, and I think the camera is there and I should look at the camera after two years of COVID, I still haven't learned um, to differentiate between the screen and the camera, obviously, uh, apparently. So um, let me introduce um, her again to you. Um, she's uh, the director of Olympics and Paralympic Development at the Major's um, Office um, of International Affairs of Los Angeles. Um, and that is a very, very important um, job in a city with many challenges, but also many opportunities. But we are also proud that she is um, part of our expert group of um, our Future city, Cities project. Um, and um, it is just really, really wonderful um, having you here today, Aaron. Um, the floor or the screen is yours. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. 
Well, thank you so much, Stormy, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so delighted to be with you and so uh, honored to be asked to, to speak today. It's difficult to, to follow um, Ms. Steinmuller because I think she had so many of the same talking points that I have with respect to what our cities are working on, how we're approaching the future that is urbanization. But what I did take away from her remarks in particular is that there may be some job opportunities in Berlin, apparently. I don't know. Maybe there's opportunities to run some projects there. So, you know, to put it bluntly, my answer to the question of, of what are the greatest challenges facing Los Angeles and why should we look to the future of cities in a transatlantic context is that cities are our collective future. You know, we've heard that urbanization is the trend and the U.S. is already 80 percent urban. Europe is more than 72 percent urban. And our cities really concentrate our collective potential, but also some of our greatest challenges. And urbanization also means that cities are experiencing many of the same challenges collectively. So we may end up finding ourselves more aligned or more focused on some of the same problems with one another than maybe we are even perhaps with our national or regional governments. And this is, I think, particularly true because we all operate in a context of some sort of constraint on the, the powers or the authorities that we have at the local level. So what we can and cannot do to actually deliver the public services that our residents depend on, whether that's housing or healthcare, or food, water, energy, or transportation. So one of the questions I really have is to steal from Kate Raworth's donut economics, our question is not really just how can cities grow or how should they grow, but how do they thrive? And I think thriving is really about growth within the boundaries and constraints of what our planet can afford and also achieving at the same time what our communities can afford. What is the type of sustainable community that we want to live in? What does that future look like? And here in Los Angeles, and I think with a lot of our partner cities around the world, this is really about prioritizing equity, ensuring access and availability of public services and creating more inviting, more walkable public spaces, more connected mobility. And so this requires investment and it requires political will. And perhaps most importantly, it requires community will, the power that cities have that other levels of government do not is that proximity that makes more acute the kind of effects of our decisions, particularly the compounded reality of those decisions over time. And so we must really bring these values of equity and inclusion and relayer them into how we reconceptualize our cities and our communities of the future. So one idea that has really started to gain momentum is from Carlos Moreno's concept of a 15 minute city that you may have heard Mayor of Paris on Hidalgo talk about as well as other mayors globally, where all of your basic needs can really be met within a 15 minute radius. And this typically leads to a more polycentric city. And we're seeing this reality play out even in how we rethink about major events like the one I helped to oversee here in Los Angeles, the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games in LA, which will not be based around a single stadium or a single sports park, but really a constellation of event spaces that are knit together throughout the region. And that pushes us then to think about that connectivity and to think about embracing how our city can interact across these various central spaces um, and more easily work together in that space. But I am not an urban planner by training, I'm a project manager, and increasingly I am a city diplomat. And these are not necessarily separate skill sets, they're really rather quite aligned when we're operating in a local government context. I think COVID really showed us some of this, you know, some of Mayor Garcetti's first calls were to other cities globally to learn from their COVID response plans, learn about drive-through testing, masking, how to reconfigure hospitals. These are really practical solutions that were our responsibility at the local level that we learned not from our national government, but from our you know, colleagues in Seoul and our colleagues in Milan. 
And I think this is true for the transnational challenges we face as well, like climate change. City networks like the C40 Climate Action Network are really at, out in front in the call for a clean and just recovery. Um, because while cities really don't control the commitments that our national governments may make, we are absolutely essential in delivering them. So again, my boss, Mayor Garcetti, uh, Los Angeles mayor, uh, as the C40 chair, brought together 1,049 cities in the race to zero as part of COP26 last year. And collectively, those over 1,000 cities were really the equivalent of the world's sixth largest emitter. So we see how this kind of collective action can result in collective impact. And so cities work together, I think, to set these more ambitious targets for one another and really create a solidarity that now exists on some of these transnational global challenges in a way that it hasn't before. And I think it's really rooted back in those practical questions about how we collectively thrive at the local level. So LA is now on track to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2035 on our grid. We're at about 43% renewable right now with 62% carbon free. Um, and so how we help others transition to this zero carbon future is something that we're working on with our partners around the world. But also then how do we design that approach in a way that ensures that the folks who need all of that access to clean energy, that need access to, to systems, that, that they can uh, access those systems, that, they, that we can deliver those resources and those services in a way that meets the variety of needs they have. And this is really where cities, local and regional governments offer the best practices from which we can borrow or steal or adapt to our own context. And that's where the diplomacy part comes in, because these exchanges are really by their very nature about collaboration, about building relationships and building trust in the process. So when I, as Los Angeles, talk about the challenges I have in trying to get to that 100% renewable energy bar, you know, I'm opening myself up to others. I'm opening myself up to the, the these other cities, these other practitioners around the world, talking about where my challenges exist, learning from them about where they may have hit snags or failures. And that collaboration really builds relationships that can endure, that create these new bridges in diplomacy that we haven't had before necessarily at this subnational level. And so I think one of the questions we need to face is not just what do our future cities look like? What do we need to do to achieve it? But how we're going to do this? And I think the answer is in the question, right? We're going to do this together. I think cities are demonstrating that right now. And I think the question is really, how do we then scale that? So I'd wanna pivot this somewhat and say, not just what can cities do, but, but what can the private sector do? How are our national governments supporting us with these exchanges, with scaling these solutions? How can the multilateral policy system really adapt and support and create space for voice? from local governments to share what they've learned and to bring their collective action to the table. So how are we gonna unlock the type of blended capital that we need to ensure that cities and local governments, some of whom cannot even issue their own types of debt, how can they access the types of financing that we need to thrive? And how are we gonna ensure that national governments respect and support the ability of local governments to best meet the needs of their residents, whether you call that subsidiarity, or you call that federalism, how do you achieve that level of interaction and support? And how do you reform our multilateral system to give our cities greater voice in shaping the future that we want? So my thesis is really that cities are stronger when we're engaged with one another and when we're working collectively, advocating collectively, for these solutions that we know exist in the practical implementation of what we do, which is delivering uh, for our residents. And I think our world gets brighter and stronger as a result. So I'll stop there. Thank you. These uh, thoughts, um, and I'm going off script again a little bit. Um, is uh, there anybody who would like to ask one question to Erin? Hannah, would you like to ask her something? You have to go. Okay. 
you have to go. We let you go. Thank you so much. Yes. And that gets me going a little bit up and down the aisle. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Sammy Wolf. Um, I have a question concerning um, how how is the urban planning project in the United States? How is it getting financed? Is it getting financed on a federal level or more on on a local um, or a city level? Who's uh, who's in charge? Because in the United States, states normally have uh, a lot more power than they to have here in Germany and already here, they have a lot of power too. It's a great question. It doesn't have a single answer except to say most cities, cities like Los Angeles have our dedicated planning department and we have dedicated master plan as well as community plans as part of that. And those community plans have various elements, things like mobility and so some of, and health, um, some of those are dictated by state and federal regulation, but then in terms of funding this, it comes from quite a wide variety of sources. So you have both private investment, city, state level investment, as well as federal investment and uh, some of what we call kind of our consolidated plan or entitlement programs. Part of the challenge that we face is in that mishmash of different sources of funding, different priorities that come with that funding, different timelines associated with the financing around that funding. And so some of what we've seen be most successful is to be able to ask voters in the region in which I live, Los Angeles County in particular, to vote in support of funding certain long-term investment projects. So in 2016, Mayor Garcetti and a coalition of leaders took what we call Measure M to the table, which was a long-term uh, small percentage addition to sales tax that results in a kind of no sunset uh, amount of money coming through uh, to support more than $120 billion of investment in public transportation projects and infrastructure throughout the region, which will build more than 15 new rail lines as part of our metro system and create greater connectivity point to point, as well as starting to look at some of the micro mobility and last mile solutions. And there's some folks that are on this call, I know that know a lot more about that. I saw Eli going into the chat, so I'll let him speak more to some of that. But that's just one example is that when we look at kind of the different elements of our infrastructure from housing to community development to transportation, one of the challenges we face is that they are all somewhat segmented. And so we're continually trying, I think, through the city and in you know, kind of concert with some of our regional colleagues to look more regionally, to look at that connectivity with folks like the Southern California Association of Governments with the state of California to really be able to address kind of more co cohesive planning. And that's starting to translate now into how we think about public right of way um, and how we can create greater, not just walkability, but declutter our streetscapes create more uh, kind of accessible walkways and greater space on the sidewalks. And also think about consolidating as we move to a smarter city, some of that layered technology into things like our light posts, right? So that our light posts are not just a street light anymore, but they're also kind of a sensor package. They're 5G, um, they're all of the things that we can come to depend on to create um, a more seamless digital environment as well. Thank you very much. Um, we have to move to the next um, section um, because, uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. And we are looking forward to seeing you um, in Los Angeles later this year because our project also moves around. Um, this is our meeting in Berlin, but we are also going to meet in Los Angeles and Atlanta earlier. Um, uh, early next next year. But now we want to um, take a closer look at some real examples. So this is going to be a um, not a speed dating, but a speed project presentation part of our meeting. And for this, I would like to ask our Berlin um, participants, Nadine, Sana, and Philip, um, up to the stage with me. So come on up. <laughs> But we are going to stay across uh, on the other side of the pond for a little while longer. Um, and um, Aaron just also already um, mentioned him. 
Um, we are now uh, joined um, by Eli, Eli, Eli uh, Lipman, also from Los Angeles, also a participant um, of our project, and he is executive director of Move LA. And um, we are going to hear um, now a little bit about that project and um, your ideas. So again, the screen is yours. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, and I hope uh, you yes. could hear Hi. Us. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, perfectly and clear. And I love the background. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yes. At Move LA, we do big stuff. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is Eli Lipman, uh, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here today. Um, I, actually, uh, I actually have, uh, very, uh, I have a, a deep appreciation for Germany. I uh, participated in the Germany close-up program at the invitation of the German government um, quite a while ago. <laughs> I'm actually looking at, uh, at, at pictures from that trip. Uh, on my wall right now. Um, and so I have a deep uh, appreciation um, for the German people. Um, and so thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so I was asked to kind of talk about opportunities that we might have uh, collectively to improve our transportation systems, um, our cities. Um, and so I'd like to, I have five ideas here and five things that I wanted to talk about in five minutes. So let's start with, let's just jump right in. Affordability. Uh, in Los Angeles, we are the most unaffordable region in the entire United States. We have more than half of our households being rent burdened. And it's just not about affordable housing, it's about low wages. So we did fight to raise the minimum wage at the city level, despite the federal government not acting, but it's still incredibly low. For instance, our bus operators, some of them earn so little amount of money uh, that they're eligible for benefits, uh, low income benefits, and some of them drive two hours because they can't afford housing near their job to then go and operate a bus and drive around the city, which is just um, crazy from a planning perspective. So we need to actually learn from our partners in other cities. You know, Germany has a very successful program right now to reduce rail fares to curb driving. Um, we need to learn from that. And right now I actually have a meeting in about an hour with a representative uh, secretary for the governor, Newsom, to, uh, for him to sign a bill that would make student transit completely free for all California students. And so that's one way that we think that affordability and creating the next generation of transit riders uh, is going to be very powerful and 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 effective. We also have to learn from trade unionists in Germany about organizing and empowering workers to organize and fight for better wages. And we're seeing those successes in small amounts with Starbucks, Amazon, and other places. But we're hopeful that we can expand that and expand the number of people um, who are earning better wages. And we need more social housing, like you have in Berlin and Vienna. Um, that's actually why we are sponsoring a ballot measure right now. It's Measure ULA. We like to do big stuff, as, as you can see. Um, and Aaron mentioned Measure M and Measure R, which we're involved with. But we have two ballot measures right now, uh, one in the city on affordable housing. Homelessness prevention includes money for social housing, includes money for um, uh, these, these collectives, essentially uh, housing collectives, where people can own a piece of that equity. And all of that housing, or most of that housing, will be built with prevailing wage. So we can actually uplift people with good wages and they can live near the urban core. We think it's actually gonna generate $900 million. We call it a mansion tax because we're actually taxing the sale of large properties. This is one of the big things we have in cities is very wealthy people with very high value properties. And we're gonna take a portion of that and invest it in affordable housing. And we also think it's going to accelerate our transit oriented communities um, uh, efforts, laws uh, on the books by adding more affordable housing near transit. And many, a lot of research has been done to show that when you have low-income households near high-quality transit in affordable housing, they don't have a car. They travel more on transit than higher-income households do. So that's one, affordability. Sustainability. We have a really big problem in California and uh, the United States, frankly, there's a whole report on it from the Eno Center about the fact that our projects cost way more and are way over budget and over time compared to our counterparts uh, in Western Europe. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
and I don't have time to go into it, but we really need to learn how to manage our projects better. And I think we can use Germany as an example for that, because even though we have this $120 billion investment in public infrastructure, it's still not gonna be enough. And Aaron knows this well, we tried to accelerate several of these projects to make the Olympics and we just couldn't do it because they're so expensive. So we need to improve our project management here in Los Angeles and in California, learn from Germany. I'd love to come there and learn actually, so that we have more sustainable projects. It's not just about the sustainability of the projects. I mean, we have these goals, you know, 2035, no, uh, only zero emission vehicles are gonna be sold. You know, 2040, we're gonna have zero, all, all zero emission trucks on the road. We have those goals here in California, but we need to improve how we deliver those projects. All right, number three, public safety. We have a crisis in the United States right now where I think 43,000 people were, were killed by traffic incidents uh, uh, last year in the United States. And in LA, it's terrible. We just had a, a couple weeks where we had these horrific crashes where pedestrians, people in cars, people on bicycles were, were, were murdered. And so we have to address public safety to make it safer to travel on the streets. And I think we can learn from cities like Copenhagen and London and Berlin about uh, Superblocks was mentioned earlier. We actually are starting a pilot here in Los Angeles. Uh, there was a motion introduced just a couple of weeks ago. And again, another reason to travel to Berlin um, to learn about Superblocks. So we need to address uh, public safety. And then I'm not gonna go into equity only just a little bit because Aaron really touched on it, but we have a very low, we have a, the largest low income population, I believe in the United States, you know, I used to work on food security. We used to say that we had the largest number of food insecure individuals in the United States. And so we have to provide those benefits in an equitable way because, you know, I just came from Westwood. There are $10 million mega mansions there, actually $70 million mega mansions there uh, in Westwood. Um, and I live in a community that is does not have any of those mansions at all. Um, there are huge disparities in our city and we have to address those. Everything right now, we have 100 degree weather outside. We have this extreme heat crisis. We've had it for a couple of days and we have hundreds of thousands of people who ride the bus every day. And I just rode the bus that have no shelter from this extreme heat. And that is a huge equity issue where we have low income individuals in particular, black, black and brown, uh, indigenous, we call the BIPOC, uh, households, individuals waiting in the heat for 20, 30 minutes to catch their bus. That's an, an equity issue. There's many equity issues that we have to address if we're going to achieve what we want to achieve in 2040. And then finally, I want to talk, I just want to briefly talk about network. You know, we have these super commuters here in Los Angeles, people who drive two hours to get to their work. That is bad for climate change. That is bad for air quality. That's why we have the worst air quality in the country. So if we are gonna achieve what we wanna achieve by 2040, we have to come up with regional transit that works for people similar to Western Europe. We have this incredible system, it's almost 500 miles, um, but it's infrequent and useless for many people. You can wait an hour if you miss your train. And if you miss the last train at eight o'clock at night, which isn't that late, you're stuck. So we need to improve the service of our system so that we have real commuter um, transit so that those people who are living outside of the urban core can actually be able to take public transit um, into the urban core. And that's an investment we need to make to make the, it the city that we want it to be by 2040. So I don't know if any of you were tracking, um, but I said five things, affordability, sustainability, spell it out with me, public safety, equity, network. What does that spell? Well, it says, let's do big stuff, huh? <laughs> no, it spells Aspen. It spells oh. Aspen. <laughs> oh, that ah. is so good. There you go. There you go. So that's it. That's what I got. Thank you. Oh, I think we just have to steal that from you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so, so very much. Um, I got some messages from my team that I do have to look at the uh, time a little bit more though. Um, five, we have to stick to five minutes, otherwise our last panel will also not be here anymore. <laughs> um, and, and I also welcome Catherine who is going to moderate that panel later on. Um, so we now move, um, go uh, on a speed train, so to say, from Los Angeles um, to Atlanta. Um, and we are going to meet uh, Latrisa, and I hope she is online. Um, she's the founder and former executive director of Atlanta Wealth Building um, Initiative. So I hope this is going to work. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure being with you all today. I am, uh, as she mentioned, Latrice McLaughlin Ryan. I am the former executive director of Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. And I'm so happy to be with you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I will try to move forward as quickly as possible to try to make up for some of our time. But uh, the remarks so far have been um, really uh, enjoyable as we have this important discussion about sustainable path towards uh, urban construction and city planning. And I was asked today to really just speak about my uh, idea about our future of cities and provide um, some insight about what that would look like when we look at 2030. And uh, again, thank you for the wonderful remarks so far. So when I think about this decade and ahead to 2030, many of the remarks that were shared earlier resonate clearly both in terms of where we are, but also where there are opportunities for growth. Um, and 2030 is quickly approaching. And so and from my perspective, a sustainable path for future cities uh, begins with maintaining a sense of uh, intentional mindfulness uh, focused on the needs and desires of its people at the core of any design and implementation of infrastructure and building and urban planning. I think sometimes um, as professionals, we can get really focused on the theories and um, and really focusing on the economic development piece and in, in that process, the people at its core that we are working to help and whose lives we are working to improve can sometimes get missed in that process. So um, when I think about uh, that planning and design, it's important that it not only um, center people, but also the planning and design creates healthy environments that promote wellness and health across the board. So uh, it creates shared physical, mental, environmental, and economic well-being and prosperity for all, which I think we're all here to try to determine how we might collectively create those solutions. This human center approach encourages disruptive thinking while relying heavily on equitable data. And I emphasize equitable data um, because Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, for example, as a data center organization, has found that um, if you do not intentionally create um, data sets that pull in a wide variety of viewpoints, um, it can be skewed and therefore not really give voice to the full community. But that equitable data and diverse perspectives uh, are required to create dynamic solutions and to create such innovative solutions, it is critical that we avoid uh, innovating from silos, which it can be very easy to do, uh, particularly as we are all working hard and, and with some urgency to address these issues as we quickly move towards 2030. Um, for the future of cities as I see it, each sector and uh, each sector of the entire ecosystem, including grassroots and grass tops organizations, government, corporations, uh, academia and other anchor institutions, as well as philanthropy um, and direct insight from community residents must be openly welcomed and encouraged to engage transparent discussions at the same time, rather than a bottom up or traditional down, uh, top down approach to create effective and sustainable solutions. A wide array of perspectives and diverse thought uh, also is our best bet to create reparative solutions that center on active and intentional community voice and participation that addresses gaps in agency and equity across sectors, including efficient and equitable access to housing, 
human services, transportation, energy, digital access, food, um, environmental justice, as well as equitable access to living wage jobs, business opportunities, and other opportunities throughout the economic systems throughout the city. While implementing an approach that intentionally centers such diverse perspectives may not move forward as quickly, and quite frankly, may create some challenges that say a traditional top-down approach um, can alleviate. Um, it also alleviates cross-sectional agency and community voice. And ultimately that agency and voice is the most effective approach for long-term sustainability and econo the economic health of our cities as a whole. Um, it's also the best approach to ensure strategies are actually accessible and used, that the resources and, and tools and infrastructure that we're building are actually used by those that they were intended to, to provide access to. Um, it also ensures that they are widely adopted and funded long term as more stakeholders are engaged and invested in the success of those solutions. And we found that to be true here in Atlanta. So when I think about Atlanta, uh, where you know Atlanta is home to uh, 30 Fortune 500 and 1,000 headquarters, it is also um, home to more than 54 colleges and universities. Overall, a great city to live. Uh, happy to to call it my hometown. But it's also currently number two in income inequality and near the bottom of the list for economic mobility. A child born into poverty in Atlanta has just a 4% chance of escaping it in his or her lifetime. So when I think about all of our great accomplishments and opportunities here, uh, in the midst of it's in the midst of incredible disparities that exist throughout the city. It's clear that more can be done to address the root causes of these disparities, which Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, for example, focuses solely on. Uh, together, we are beginning to develop as a city, across the city, develop solutions that focus on the intersectionality of these systems that, while successful in some ways, currently create barriers to share prosperity for all. Uh, I'm proud of the way we are beginning to come together to uh, intentionally create more green spaces in addition to some of our more innovative solutions like the Atlanta Beltline, which is a mobility innovation that connects neighborhoods across the city by creating a walk path, um, excuse me, walk bike path around the perimeter of the city that is bordered by a variety of small businesses, schools, uh, larger corporate uh, headquarters, entertainment and services, amenities, restaurants. However, there are critical lessons learned. Um, that from this solution during the, the past 15 years where requirements for community wealth building and intentional inclusive economy structures are critical to address the disparities created by the solution. Again, deep engagement with community voice and agency and inclusive growth in zoning are essential to minimize such disparities. And what we found is that often there's alignment with existing um, residents in the community with any urban planning that has been created, but without that intentionality to include that voice, those uh, existing residents can often be um, either pushed out or not have an opportunity to fully engage. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. And through solutions uh, in neighborhoods like Rowe Park, where they are developing um, basically decentralized urban planning led by community insight, to ensure each local neighborhood has access to all essential services and amenities within about 15 minutes or so. Uh, this includes affordable housing, health care, A plus education, or A plus cradle to college education, um, green spaces, small business development, and living wage jobs, as well as corporate jobs, um, which is a, a, an exciting example of what could come and what could be. Um, a, a prim uh, or a, a primary example of community growth here in Atlanta in 2030. Overall, Atlanta provides and is creating some promising solutions, but when I look toward 2030, Atlanta and other cities must not only attract talent and businesses externally, but also implement dedicated strategies and invest deeply in the growth and sustainability of local talent in addition to talent attracted to the city. Um, we also must create pathways to living wage jobs, 
um, and access the capital and revenue generation for local small businesses so they may grow and scale. And all this must be done at the neighborhood level to ensure that those services are available, that we can address mobility issues, cost of housing, but also cost of, of, of mobility and the impact that it has on our environment where everyone must drive, say, 30, 40 minutes north of the city to higher paying jobs rather than having access to those jobs in our local community. So to properly address the, the intersection of all these systems, it begins with change human behavior, um, creating, again, access to and in, in pathways for agency and voice, or as I like to say, also changing hearts and minds to do things a bit differently. This takes patience as well, uh, patient engagement, patient data collection, patient capital. Um, however, such patience and uh, understanding is required for disruptive dynamic change that does not repeat bell models. Um, that only create additional disparities and widen social and economic gap. Thank you so very, very much. Um, that was a um, wonderful insight into uh, the city of Atlanta. Um, and I have to say, I love the walkway. Um, it is uh, such a pleasurable um, and um, innovative uh, space um, in a city. Um, and uh, we want to um, hear a little bit more from your, your city. Um, let me first ask a question. How many of you came here with bike tonight? Really quite a few. Who are going uh, taking their bike to the office in the morning? Also quite a few. Um, and who would like to see more bike lanes in Berlin? <laughs> so that's an easy answer. Huh? And with this, um, we are now um, going to be joined uh, by Nidra, um, who's the founder and CEO of Civil Bikes um, from Atlanta. And I just have to ask again to stay in the timeline. It's really hard for me to, to do the timekeeper up here with such a hybrid uh, panel. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, hello, good morning, good evening and afternoon, everyone. Um, I am delighted to be here. We have all listened to great presentations on building our future cities with intention and specificity um, by addressing past harms, destructive policies and practices. So um, this is a great group of people, uh, a transnational group collectively thinking, discussing and co-creating our futures together. I am here today, so I will stay in my time frame because this is short and sweet. Um, I am discussing my perspective as a community organizer and activist, public historian, um, where I bring people together where we contemplate, engage our collective histories, collective memory, using active transportation, namely biking and walking in public spaces. So I'm a fan of public space. I'm a, a fan of bringing people together um, and also uh, communication, especially when it is difficult. So, um, I, this is an aspirational, aspirational talk and just thinking about what I want 2040 to look like, thinking of a healthier and vibrant city. Um, sustainable mobility is an idea that is past its time. It's more important now than ever to offer an image of what this looks like. Um, I'll take a leave from critiquing the US uh, the state where I'm from, Georgia, and the city where I am from as well, Atlanta, um, on mobility and talk about feeling um, and embodiment. Uh, 2040 is not far away. It's only 18 years from now. And um, I would like to see a system of mobility that embodies sustainability, that embodies belongingness, and has been able to operationalize justice. And this is justice of all kinds, racial justice, economic justice, ability, climate justice, um, and that these are centers of our values. John Powell, um, executive director of the Othering and Belonging Institute does a great job researching, thinking, discussing, and creating data, looking at history, um, creating policies around um, belongingness. And, operationalize racial these types of justices so i would say check out his website and you know go and do a deep dive there um, for me it, this would mean that mobility um, takes on an active form um, that it 
that we are ongoing doing the work of acknowledging historical and contemporary harms that's been created by transportation, by mobility planning, by our policies and by practices. And so this means that we are always reflecting, critiquing, analyzing, understanding, questioning um, the meaning of mobility um, and how to create and design a system that allows for everyone who lives within it to be able to um, expand and also be mobile um, in their lives. And um, it means that mobility is, is both a local and international situation. We are borderless. This is a great experience because it allows us to think about critically about where we are, where we live, but also to think of how are we connected to other places, other countries. Um, in, our, in a borderless society, we will see the movement of people and goods be able to move in a way that is connected, that does minimal damage to our environment, that includes the types of materials we use, how it's powered, how it's built and designed, um, and that things are consciously planned with diversity in mind and also is one of those key values. Um, I do not have, uh, my. I have five tenants, you know, five core tenants as well, but it would not spell out Aspen. Um, so the core tenants that I think are necessary in order to create a just, a sustainable mobility means that is active transportation mod modalities are um, created where all body types, um, so we're addressing ableism, fitness levels, comfortability, and preferences are um, activated. Um, we are designing, um, it's designed to for climate remediation that we are into that is integrative so we're integrating design that enhances and supports a healthy climate and that it's also adaptive um it is this type of system is far reaching it's accessible and it's accessible around cost um, the ease of use that is easy to understand is easy to bring your bike or your stroller or your wheelchair um, mobility device in on there that it's um, accessible in different languages so no matter where if we're trans if we're trans uh, going across borders we're able to understand where we're going where to get off um, how to use the system it embodies belongingness so matter no matter your race ability gender gender expression economic level anything you're able to feel like you belong in this system it's designed for you and you can use it um, and that at the foundation of all of this is the value of justice, that it is um, addressing historical harms in order that the contemporary use is one of ease and it conveys that the user is valuable um, because we love where we are, we love our environment, and we want to um, create a, a whole a system, a whole system um, of health and um, vitality. So. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, very much. And uh, check, check out the web page. Um, it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, and I hope to take one of those bikes when we visit. Now we come back to Berlin. Um, and um, you have been waiting very, very patiently um, up here. Um, so let me introduce uh, Nadine Kula von Bergmann. Um, you are um, the founder and managing director of Creative uh, Climate Cities. And we are looking uh, forward to hearing from you. Does this work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me um, up here also to share a little bit my view, I would say, um, on Berlin and on the current developments. And um, I can tell you, um, I'm not as positive as so many people uh, seeing this uh, from outside. And you're asking the question, fit for future, um, a sustainable path towards urban construction and city planning. And I would say, no, we definitely not fit for future here in Berlin. Um, and why do I think that? Um, actually, we had a huge chance in COVID and, and the ones who were here uh, in the city and, and who actually had this experience for about um, two years 
with a few lockdowns, um, we saw how much the city was really or came to a still stand in those days. And I would say we really missed a few chances uh, to turn things around that are huge challenges and huge injustice. Um, and one of the things we really say, and we mentioned that positively already um, a few times, obviously are things like pop-up bike streets and, and maybe, you know, Friedrichstraße obviously in the heart of the center, we can walk through and we love it, but um, this is also uh, really just for people who have the time and who have maybe business also in these areas. Um, so why do, why do people move to Berlin. I just met also this week a few newcomers and everyone is still excited about cafes and cultural things, et cetera, et cetera. Well, obviously for um, services, that might not be offered in, in other cities. Um, it's access uh, to, to job opportunities, to cultural life, uh, to also the highly praised green infrastructure. For the matter uh, of fact, it was actually, I remember during COVID that it was such a difference if you were allowed to walk around the block in Kreuzberg or Neukölln, or the opportunities to you had probably in the Southern suburbs of the city. And that was one of the huge injust injustice uh, things that I also read about in New York, like the difference um, of access to these recreational uh, kind of areas. And we found, like, we noticed them, we experienced them on our own bodies, and uh, there was no debate around it, um, never mind discussions or huge think tanks, uh, like I find for other things. Um, access to mobility, also from outside, we heard today, what a great system we have, but like, Listening to Atlanta and Los Angeles carefully, I feel this is where Berlin is currently moving towards in 2040. This is where I see Berlin, honestly. Um, like a few people won't be able to afford the public transport. And, and the nine euro ticket uh, that we also try and praise highly is something where I noticed listening around with family and friends and, and talking to people, especially the elderly and especially the youngsters, some of them, well, maybe the youngsters tried and, and explored Germany a little bit, but the elderly people actually decided not to go and take public transport anymore because it was so stuffed. It was actually almost dangerous if you had some um, uh, disabilities um, to join the club and move on every day or on, on a normal um, time and hour. So, so this is something uh, where I feel that, yes, we have the pop-up bike lanes, but um, we haven't changed a single street around. We just painted a few um, yeah, a few lines on, on the street. Sorry for being so radical, but um, I think we need to uh, level this out a bit here. Um, and then the same uh, goes for access to digital, the, our digital world and our um, new work that we're also so proud of. I mean, Berlin has great co-working spaces, but it's a very small share of our society who can um, take part in this new world. And we still uh, are actually uh, basing our, we, we, we need people who are um, yeah, uh, securing other uh, life services, obviously as, as hospitals, schools, the uh, delivery services, et cetera, et cetera. And these people need to get out of their house. And unfortunately, they can't um, also um, yeah, participate and, and, um, and, and love this, this great new work life. So um, we haven't spent more, I would say, at least from the numbers I, I heard. So it's good that, we, unfortunately, the politician left, but we actually, the budgets, I think, should be, uh, should be uh, considered. Uh, in this direction. So, but I'm obviously not negative in my everyday life. I mean, I'm an architect and urban designer. I used to really try through spatial design most of my life and change something. And, and I've also, I don't know, it's, 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 the, it's the week of think tanks. I think it's the third uh, for me gathering here with people. So I'm enjoying this, but we, we, I've heard, I think at least 10 examples of Copenhagen. I've seen at least five bike lanes from Copenhagen this week. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I've given up on the spatial design part now because yes, we can obviously try, but we know this takes about 20 years to have one in Berlin, like maybe the second or third level. I mean, it would be great. There's great initiatives here, Radbahn Berlin, who really try and transition a few uh, U-Bahn spaces around. Good luck for them. I really hope they're holding on to this uh, without burnouts, etc. cetera. Um, so um, what, I've tried to, um, what I've tried to do instead 
I've changed sides a bit and I'm working mainly with municipalities now and I'm redesigning governance structures actually. Um, we are part of a, of a program uh, around digital cities, smart cities, but we'll explain this later what that means in Germany. It's a bit different to the, to the American terminology. So what we do, we actually coach municipalities to um, yeah, not, not to just design the measures and the pilot projects, but to really help them how to communicate these innovative paths, how to build structures, how to get a mandate to actually take a few decisions and also bring the coalition of willing people together and to march through, because this is what we need. We really need a much more radical change. And I've talked to someone here from a pilot project in Berlin today already called Siemensstadt. And I heard again that the problems are not the new ideas The you know, we, we know it all. We know how we could change the world around but we it stops in the municipalities and and we have a um in germany you say a dickest bread i don't know the english terminology here so we got a quite a, a lot ahead of us um so what i do with my team creative climate cities we we look into governance structures and we also do design processes not just participatory processes but we try and and also introduce a couple of in this case, also digital tools that help to cross sectoral thinking, to put it all together in one basket. Yeah, everyone has a different challenge, but we match make people so they come to one table and talk actually uh, what has to be solved all together because we have limited physical space. These are actually our real constraints. Yeah, there's just a few. Uh, I guess, uh, places left in Berlin, although that's probably already gone. So physical space is the, is the thing. Budgets are limited and our workforce. I mean, we can really say everyone here who runs a company, it's, it's a hell out of work to get good people in and to grow. Um, and yeah, and last but not least, um, we also do design digital tools because it's funny, I'm actually not even interested in what comes out of an urban uh, data platform or the digital twin. Uh, but some of you might have worked with that. What's interesting is if you think with people about where the data comes from and how this all comes together and what the interfaces actually are, you do think intersexual and that makes a huge change in the mind of people. And you look at me already because <laughs> I didn't think I would make the five minutes because I prepared so badly, but anyways. Um, so um, so what I would like to, to give here um, as my opinion, what do we need? We definitely need more uh, brave city leads, more uh, people uh, taking jobs on in municipalities that come from somewhere else. Um, and yeah, and, and we, we have to put a lot of money into this, that's for sure, um, because this injustice can't go on. And muddling through, like we heard already before, could be a way, but we need these intermediaries and, and we need um, a few people who stand up and, and let these great initiatives, like we heard today, um, to really come to life and to survive. Thank you Thanks. so very, very much for, for, for spicing it up. It all felt very comfortable and cozy before you spoke, but this is why we are here. And you said we need brave people in the, uh, city, in, in, in the city decision making body, so to say. And we have two brave people here with us uh, today. Um, Sana. <laughs> And especially coming after Nadine, yeah. very brave, uh, <laughs> Sana and Philip from the Berlin uh, uh, Senate Department for Urban Development and Building and Housing. And um, you're also part of our project um, supporting us. And so the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Nadine, for the <laughs> input before us, because I think it's quite interesting, or I'm looking forward to the discussion later on, because I think that we have quite a uh, we prepared an input that will be a little bit of a contrast because we are two very motivated and um, well, um, yeah, maybe looking a little bit more positive into future and um, and uh, to, uh, on our perspective on the city of Berlin um, is maybe a little bit yeah, more bright. Uh, let's see what the discussion will bring later on. Uh, we were um, asked to show a little bit um, of um, Berlin and to speak about the um, urban developments um, and ideas that we see in Berlin. We are urban planners working in different departments, but we uh, took the opportunity to uh, prepare this input together and to think together. And we, what we prepared is um, 
yeah, an introduction to Berlin and uh, especially for those of our partners who haven't had the chance to visit the city yet. Uh, we present five um, strategies or hypotheses from Berlin that we think are interesting in order to develop sustainable cities in the future. And we use projects um, that we think are interesting and where we found interesting approaches that illustrate these five strategies and ideas. Um, yeah, we heard a lot about uh, the challenges already from climate change to globalization. We face um, challenges today already that will shape the city, uh, the futures, the cities in a, the future even more, uh, like from building environment to mobility, ways of dealing with resources, economics, or social interactions. And uh, we thought that we find the sustainable development is not only driven by technolo technological inventions. Ah, yeah, please. Um, in the other direction, maybe. Yeah. But, um, but we uh, yeah, think that um, the mo most important thing is to, uh, to, in, to provide access to education, mobility. We already he heard about this, so I won't go into detail. And we think that um, it's important to um, allow uh, social participation uh, so that we are not only uh, providing technological inventions to shape the future city. As urban planners, we try to develop integrated strategies that are people focused and enhance the healthy living quality in the city. And our, pro uh, and our approach is um, yeah, to turn uh, challenges into qualities or um, so that means that challenges that we meet today are uh, the starting point for solutions that enhance our urban environment in more than only one way. And um, yeah, we prepared uh, our input before that we thought about different, um, uh, different um, yeah, future um, uh, developments. And we um, yeah, prepared five uh, strategies that we will now go more into detail and we illustrate them with pictures and projects from Berlin. Maybe then, may I? Next. Oh, no. So our first strategy is the just and diverse um, city. Digitalization and mobility are accelerating social um, change. And especially now in the context of a global crisis, like for instance, the pandemic or climate change, um, we see that parts of the population are no longer involved in democratic processes and able to participate in social interactions. And so therefore we think it's a central task to avoid, uh, or avoid or reduce polarization and segregation. We already heard this from other cities before. And we find that it needs compact, healthy, diverse, green and mixed use neighborhoods to allow social participation. So the first um, project that we brought is an interesting example um, called Voho. It's in Berlin Kreuzberg. It's a wooden skyscraper that's uh, being built in the inner city and that offers housing, commercial and working in only one building. The idea is to offer um, the living quality of a historical neighborhood, but and all functions um, that uh, are combined are, of course, only used by um, yeah, using a minimum footprint to reduce soil consumption. So all programs are mixed and organized in a vertically way. And another idea to, um, or another project to illustrate um, the idea of the just and diverse city is the Lock Depot uh, in Berlin uh, Schöneberg. It's built on a former marshalling yard or shunting yard that was no longer in, uh, needed anymore. So there's still a central connection for trains next to this housing complex. So it's out of the picture, uh, meaning that there is still heavy noise in the neighborhood. But uh, with this intelligent concept, it was able to build a housing uh, next to the train line. So um, we also like it because it's, um, it offers a variety of different housing typologies to offer a variety and um, housing for yeah, many different peoples. And it has this very characteristic appearance um, um, that brings it all together, forms an own identity of, yeah, for this formerly brownfield area. And um, the second 
idea um, that we uh, want to present is the city from landscape or the um, strategy that we think is important because in uh, the context of climate change we think that climate change can lead to increase um, to an increase in heavy rainfall we heard that earlier and as well as hotter summer or longer yeah dry periods so the challenge especially is um, yeah this is especially um, a challenge with the increase of uh, ongoing densification of city centers so to, to develop city from landscape um, um, I mean, we want to illustrate it by two different uh, projects. The one is the Gleisdreieck Park on the left side is also a former brownfield area that was transformed into a versatile park for sports, recreation, but also um, there are integrated um, small green areas um, that are not accessible to public, so they can be developed freely and uh, wildly in order to foster biodiversity and um, natural environments. And it also uh, means to create integrated um, yeah, urban systems that respect natural resources. And the idea that we brought um, for this um, part is uh, the project uh, Tegel uh, Schumacher Quartier on the right side, because especially in new urban um, development areas, we have the chance to uh, implement new sustainable solutions and um, this um, image or this project uh, should illustrate that um, um, an integrated mixed use area that was uh, is built on a former um, airport um, area. And the park here is not only the center of the neighborhood, but it is um, also part of the blue green infrastructure of the new um, urban area. And yeah, you can see on the picture, it also, um, the urban quarter also brings um, green facades, green um, roofs. So of course, everything is meant to um, help uh, provide a healthy microclimate in the area. And um, it also is, uh, the park is used to provide space to implement decentralized um, management systems for rainwater in the area. And of course, um, this, uh, I, uh, this uh, idea brings more, and this project brings much more um, yeah, issues with it. Uh, for instance, the um, housing is uh, built of wood that comes from Brandenburg close by. So not a long way from Brandenburg to Berlin to help um, build the construction on the site. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit nervous with the time. <laughs> I'm hurrying up. Is the mic on? Okay. Um, so the next quality uh, we think is important is to build on a city of short distances. Um, short distance matter to prevent traffic uh, and enable people um, to participate in services and goods. Um, Berlin has a very long tradition in supporting its polycentric city structure with many and evenly distributed town centers so that ways are short. And um, Erin mentioned already uh, the concept of the five minute city. Um, and due to this historically grown um, polycentric city structure, Berlin in many ways already is um, a 15 minute city, but uh, it is of course very important um, to, to achieve this potential um, to improve infrastructure so that the access um, is fairly granted to everyone to the benefits of this polycentric structure. Also here two um, examples of Berlin. The first example on um, the left hand is a new development in the Berlin borough of Tempelhof. The project is called New Center Tempelhof and it is um, interesting because many different um, social and public uh, uses now uh, being scattered on different plots of land all over the area they are now brought all together in a, what we call a ochade. And um, the image shows um, one result, and that is the multifunctional building, including the borough's town hall, a library, music school, education centers, arts, cultures, and a museum. And um, the other um, image, well, that is the 
often uh, mentioned pop-up bike lane that also Hannah Steinmüller uh, mentioned that um, came up during the pandemic. And I'm not so pessimistic about um, the, the bike lanes, even though, well, the design is not always the best, definitely not. Um, but um, I think that the, the debate about the distribution of the space from car to another, that is the most important thing about that. And that was a good chance that um, that was, um, was taken. So um, the next quality is the productive city. And by that, we mean a city um, with a diverse economic structure so that the city is resilient against external shocks and crisis. And of course, this economic diversity is also important to provide various jobs um, for people with various skills. Not everyone is a rocket scientist or very creative, but a city has to provide jobs for other skills so that all people um, can participate in the job market. And the other aspect um, is about innovation and the creative potential that a city should give place to, to successfully manage um, the economics uh, and, and social change. Also here, two examples. The first example, we have an expert here in the audience on the first example. Um, the first example shows the aerial view of the master plan um, of for the uh, reuse of the former airport Tegel. Um, it's one of the biggest developments in Berlin. And once it finished, it will uh, be home for a University of Applied Science and next to an aerial area of almost 80 hectares of, uh, for innovative industries. If you are there right now, you can't see it. It's just a closed airport and closed airfield. But um, yeah, I think it's one of Berlin's most ambitious projects, definitely. And the other image uh, shows the so-called, it's just a rendering, um, it shows the so-called Dragoons area. It's a former garrison uh, in a, well, fairly poor state um, that today hosts some small businesses and culture, and it will be densified and building. And that is the real important thing about it. It will be together developed with the local people and it will be turned into a mixed use area. So here it's the, um, the creativity of the locals that really enriches the project. And I hate to cut you off, but... It's, it's one minute? One minute. Okay, so okay, the, last, minute. the last quality <laughs> is uh, uh, the city as a market square. And um, this is to well, close uh, and come back to what uh, um, Sana said about the just city. Um, because we think that polarization is, uh, next to uh, climate change, the, the major topic of the future. And we um, consider the market square not as a theoretical economical market, but uh, as a real place where people can gather and come together for exchange. So, and here we have again two um, projects. The one is the House of Statistics. Um, a former uh, building from the 70s that was abandoned for recent years and that is now turned um, uh, into a mixed use building and the very important thing about it is that this project comes from a grassroots movement. It was intentionally intended to, uh, uh, to sell the, the whole plot and the property and now it's developed together with a civic society. And the image on the right side um, shows uh, yeah, Berlin's most special park. It's the former airfield Tempelhof. And this is iconic as a sign of freedom and for experimentation. And well, yeah, so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Give a big applause. And, and with this, we have a flying change to somebody who's much a much better moderator than I and timekeeper. And I hope you give her a little bit more time um, that we go a little bit over time. I would like to ask my team to come up here to exchange the water and the glasses so that our panelists also have some water. Um, so Catherine Kluver Eschburg, um, she is um, vice president, executive vice president um, of the Bertelsmann Stiftung and also a, an expert on cities. Um, and thank you so much for being here and a real transatlantische Pflanze.
Well, thank you, Stormy. That's that is probably the most gracious introduction I've uh, received in a long time. But let me tell you why it's such a pleasure for me to be here. First of all, I was in, I began my professional life as an Atlantan, so uh, I have many many views and ideas on Atlanta. Erin, in her presentation, was much too modest because. Uh, in addition to doing what she does for Los Angeles, she's doing some incredible work for the United States, which is that she wrangled me and a number of other experts into thinking about the connection between state and city uh, diplomacy as it relates to national policy. And my entry point to this work is not only that I worked for the Bloomberg administration in New York City, but really that I think a lot about urban power. And Erin helped us think about urban power as it relates to the State Department and as how the State Department needs to think about using its own cities and thinking more structurally about um, city and international diplomacy and that nexus. But we've heard a lot this evening about the mindful city. Uh, we've heard about Schumann thriving and Schumann uh, forthcoming. We've heard about turning back past harms, which I find particularly fascinating for the panel that I'm going to uh, discuss with here in just a second. Um, and we've heard a lot about what seems to work in Berlin, but we haven't talked a lot about time horizons to pick up on the, some of the critical components we heard here. So it gives me really great pleasure to bring up um, my panelists this evening. Please come and join me as the water is being rearranged. Um, I'll introduce them to you uh, if they want to come up in alphabetical order, because it's useful to give them give a little bit of context, because one man has already been mentioned in the context of some of these uh, images that you've seen here on the screen. And that's Dr. Philippe Boutelier, who's now the managing a par partner at Art Poyek, but he was until very recently uh, in part charged with um, this wonderful utopia at Tegel. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Philipp Boutselier. <laughs> Next, we have Andreas Gebhardt. And I really enjoyed watching a talk of his in 2017. So here's a man who's been re-envisioning how we have discussions about utopia and reality in the city for quite some time. He's the founder and CEO of Republica, a conference that in Berlin you know well. He's the chairman and found of the foundation board Stiftung Zukunft Berlin. And his festival, Republica, is really a place where you rethink digital society and a place, and I think this fits with the themes that we heard, and I'm quoting, engagement, responsibility, emancipation, and empathy in digital society. I like that very much. So we'll pick up on that theme. Um, Good to be here. Next, the only other woman in this round, Elisabeth Mansfeld, please join us up here. She's the head of the Cities Program at the Alfred Herrhausen uh, Foundation. She's a certified expert in sustainable finance because we haven't enough talked, frankly, about what this is all going to cost and how we get it built and put into place. Um, she spent nine years as project manager and chief operating office uh, at Deutsche Bank's asset management division. And she's now thought a lot about microfinancing and we'll hear what she has to say on the urban dimension. So please join me in welcoming Elisabeth. And finally, speaking of how we get it all built and the sustainability of materials and how it's all going to come together, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tilman Prinz, who's gonna walk up as I introduce him. He's the Secretary General of the Federal Chamber of German Architects. That's 16 federated entities. So the umbrella organization of 16 different federal states. And if you think, uh, you know, coming up with divergent opinions on the cities, I do not want your job because that frankly, 130,000 architects landscape and interior architects, that seems a lot to wrangle. So um, please join me, uh, please in, in welcoming Dr. Tillmann Prinz. So we've been part of the forecasting exercise at the heart of Aspen with all of these cities and trying to think out the city of 2040, but we had some really sobering words about the realities of forecasting the future. And some of those are structural, some of those are cultural, because here we're gonna talk about Berlin. Um, Berlin is a city, of course, which took a long time to grow back together. It spent the last 30 years trying to recenter itself. We heard about the advantages of polycentrism, but all of us who live in Berlin have also very much experienced the negativities of polycentrism that had a wall, a chasm cut right through it, and how Berlin has had to contend with those tensions, but also the utopian visions that might come with that. So I wanted to have all of you first do a little reality check, because we're thinking about 2040. 
Is that a short period of time? Or is that a long period of time for Berlin, given the last 30 years it's looked at and what that means for everything we've heard on sustainability, on human thriving, on putting the human back at the center of planning. So Philip, is this a long period of time or a short period of time for advancing the city of Berlin in that direction? I came to Berlin in uh, 1989 before the wall came down and what happened thereafter uh, within a decade was absolutely breathtaking. So 10 years um, can be a very long time um, with massive changes as we've seen, but it takes a crisis or a unique event for a normal city, which uh, transforms at a rate of about 1% per year in, in, uh, in Europe at least, um, it's a very short time. So when we talk about structural changes, infrastructures, everything's so slow, um, so it depends. Well, it depends. And yet we've had just another cataclysmic crisis, which we've talked about here, which was COVID and will be again COVID, if you will, in the fall. So Andreas, if you think about human and human thriving in the city, which you've done a lot of and using digital tools to enhance human thriving, even when we're disconnected from one another, 10 years a long time or a short time? Scars uh, stay forever. And you will always remember this disruption. And in the COVID sense, I cannot answer your question precisely because it's not over. Right. And it's not in, we are not in a situation to say for the event sector or for the intellectual discourse sector or for whatever um, you want to mention on my work. Um, it's, it's over this situation, mm -hmm. this, it, it will last forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, and that's what I take out of this evening today, is that a lot of um, different people have to solve problems which they didn't been um, responsible for. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of women, a lot of uh, young people, a lot of uh, interesting people discussing tonight about um, the impact of climate crisis and the fucked up structure of architecture, uh, uh, ideas, uh, two cities from the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to, to uh, fix this fuck up, uh, it, it may take more than 10 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it can also, uh, take only one or two years if the solution is clear enough, like we had this bike lane example right. today, because this is a rapid response on a pro problem, which is not, um, it was not a solution to um, pollution and to too much traffic. It was a, a solution to nobody want and can drive public um, transportation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, it, so the rapid response is, uh, I finished, I'm sorry, I waited a long for giving a few words mm -hmm. to you, uh, but um, the, the rapid response on, uh, on problems we see in cities can be very, very fast mm -hmm. if it is not over, uh, over discussed. And uh, if it is, and we had the, the discussion with a lot of people, from public administration side, um, if it is not um, on a legislative level too long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe these small um, corridors of change had been happening in uh, 1989, had been in COVID, will be maybe happening this winter in Berlin mm -hmm. about the energy crisis. Mm -hmm. But these are small. Um, corridors of um, Change, changing things, yeah, yeah. which are not possible in, uh, I don't know how often you've been in Los Angeles, but this is a complete non-comparable city to yeah. Berlin. Yeah. And yeah. so it can be compared in a, in a sense of um, what happens here could be done there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can talk the evening. 
incrementalism in city planning and city change um, and the shock that crisis cuts through that. Um, I mean, Elizabeth, at the end of the day, you know, novel products, novel projects need to be financed. And we're seeing cities all over the planet, frankly, um, you know, realign with one another to exchange best practice on, in some cases, how they can funnel money around their national capitals to quote unquote, get done what they, and Andreas pointed out, you know, there's a great urgency. There's urgency that comes with density in a way that, you know, that might not feel as, well, Berlin is a national capital. So you'd think that it's compounded here and things move faster. But again, to you, 10 years, short time, long time, in terms of getting ideas, utopian visions paid for, put in place, again, with, with this idea of keeping the human at the center. Thank you, um, Catherine. Um, I think um, uh, finance is is the key for for the time for the for time perspective of ten years, twenty years, because finance is the basic of how we get get um, the, the projects um, realized. And probably that's only just an imagination by myself. Um, thinking about um, if it's um, financed only by national governance, it would take probably 20 years. And that brings me to the point, to the point that um, the concepts of how communities or um, cities are uh, having structured their, um, um, the finance, their, their, their earnings and the financial um, structure of taxation, um, private sector fundings and of uh, specific projects. It's so, it's getting more and more important to have the um, private sector involved and um, um, approaching like um, PPPs, private um, public partnerships, which are more successful to getting a, a faster realization of um, specific projects. But for, I think Philip can talk um, probably more about the, the finance and the um, administrative um, desert, which might might be behind um, instead of me. But um, I, um, uh, the last year and this year, we have um, in our, uh, at the Alfred Housing Gesellschaft, uh, a program, um, um, a fellowship program where um, um, American cities and coming back to the comparison of American cities and German cities, where American cities and um, German cities, um, we compared through a fellowship of 10 Americans and 10 um, um, German fellows, and we visited um, in Germany three cities and in Amer America three cities, and seeing how, um, as well, talking to the mayors and seeing how uh, they approaching their their specific pilot projects on financing as well through different channels. There's we still can learn. Germany still can learn from the private sector engagement in America, and as well, America asks us always, how do you do this with the communities and the um, municipality of finance and taxation systems? So they're on both sides, there are different approaches where the exchange of learning is so important um, to get this 10 years, um, our 10 years um, objectives um, realized. And the value and benefit of forecasting, of course, is it shows where we might formulate utopias, but it also shows up major challenges. And I think as architects, what probably most architects have struggled with most distinctly in this crisis and post-crisis is all the things that the globe struggles with, which is to say um, value chains disrupted, the, the lack of qualified workers, you know, all the things that are coming to haunt us as a wider society. But uh, this, this came to mention that the things that we did wrong in the 70s when we relied art for on architects to design space in which then we humans would put on human thriving. Um, and we've seen how that's gone uh, belly up, shall we say, in France and in other places where we designed for human interaction and that cataclysmically failed. So now taking you as, as the, the pinpoint for 130,000 of your colleagues, um, you know, given, given this crisis that we've had, how do we make good on the crisis? And are the next 10 years, or even if we take 20, 40, 18 years, is that a short horizon or a long horizon? I would agree with, with Philip, it's a, it's a long time because I lived for the last 20 years in Berlin and the change, if you look 20 years back, is so incredible big that 10 years can actually be a very long time. They can achieve a lot. 
um, at the moment, architects turn around dramatically in their thinking, and they're going from new buildings to refurbishment. It's all about the building stock. It's all about innovation. It's about uh, putting um, new uh, stories on the buildings and all of that. So there, there's a dramatic turnaround. There, there was the Carta of Athens, which was all about the cars, and we were just living in a city where obviously cars dominate everything. And now we have the chart of Leipzig, which already turned around. And uh, with actually Liz Mohn was in Rome with Shane Huber, and they all um, decided on the chart of Rome now, which again um, emphasizes the, the sustainable city and, and uh, living together. So I think that there's a big turnaround and architects really take a lead in that now. Um, administration, particularly in Berlin, is a huge challenge, and we spoke about the Friedrichstraße, which is a nice idea and done so bad, <laughs> so bad. And, it's, and, and yeah, and that, that is very disappointing. And we mentioned Copenhagen several times, and you cannot mention it enough. I mean, it is the role model of, of the city. Down to the it. architecture of its office parks, by the way, because I was extremely impressed because Philip works or worked a lot through the medium and modicum of wood in Tegel. And I was recently, I had to give a talk in a Copenhagen office park. And I will tell you, I was impressed by the human size, scale and use of wood mm -hmm. in the architecture and in building the communal spaces. So I, I, I hear that. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I completely agree. Yeah. No, no, absolutely right. And, and the superblocks in Barcelona already, of course, are long established. I mean, there is nothing new. It's not rocket science. Um, I think it's really the administrational problem here. But one point you mentioned is, is really funny. You think as the national capital, we should be faster. No, I think we in, in Berlin, I think Munich and Hamburg, and they do it. They develop. They really get things done. And we very slowly come behind. But maybe in a different way, maybe a little more creative, maybe, maybe more individual. So I think Berlin still gets this very unique character, which attracts a lot of people to come here because it has this freedom. And with this freedom or with this chaos comes freedom, with this freedom comes a little chaos. And I think we have to find a balance in all of that, because I think we appreciate that freedom here as well, that things are not really running that well. And that's also a quality in the city. If everything would be so sleek and so mainstream, I think many of us wouldn't want to live here. So that is a quality. Yeah, well, I'm not sure my former boss, Michael Bloomberg, is going to agree with you on that point, but we'll just we'll just take that with a grain of salt. Andreas, you wanted to come in. I'm so sorry. I have two, two parts now. First thing is this fuck up Friedrichstraße and the environment around that. It's not against bikes. It's about the fuck up architecture around there. So this street, if the underpaid people who had to work for this lane without cars are blamed with you or from you now, I'm sorry, this is too poor for me. Uh, this is really not the, the situation. I'm really, really sorry. And I thought I'm invited here as um, uh, part of the future of Berlin uh, position I am in. Stiftung Zukunft Berlin, so, so longer term discussions. And I want to just bring a small input, maybe one or two minutes on that, because this is much over the discussion. Is there a bike lane or whatever? This is, this is nuts. Yeah. We are in a emergency situation to change cities overall. And there are a few points like energy, water, and personal security, which is also interesting for our partners from Los Angeles and from Atlanta, which where, where, where the city crisis is much harder than here, we have to solve. And uh, what we have to think about is that who is creating the future city? And this is fucking not the architects and not the city planners. There has to be uh, another resource to make it more sustainable. That can be maybe nature. Mm -hmm. And people who are able to create environment to give nature more point. And my, and that's why I'm a little bit angry that I will have to wait for hours here to get on the panel. I was, just, I was thinking about getting a little bit more involved in the discussion. The main core thing is 
how to build city in the future. And this is about how to include cultural and human centric approaches into new buildings, because there's no soul in Dubai and there will be no soul in new buildings in G Egypt, how to build uh, and educate architects to um, how to organize the cultural heritage which has Berlin brought to all of us, to you, to you, all we are here, all the niches and the opportunities mm -hmm. into new built infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And we have, to, we have to discuss about that because yeah. this is very deeply um, connected to sustainability. Yeah. Philip, you've been so engaged with that over this past year to think about how to imbue with the Tegel project and then now moving on and teaching the next generation to think about these aspects because in as much as we find similarities in our large cities, I think the cultural aspect is one that's critically different in terms of how we how we lean on our populations, how we bring people in, how we think about how they're going to imbue this space. Can you share a little bit about how you thought about that with Tegel and where you think that that is going or where you think in general, how culture circumscribes our, our opportunities and, and possibilities? It's been 10 years and um, when we started in 2012 to work on this then active airport, but to convert the whole thing, we learned pretty soon that, um, that a lot of the challenges we had ahead of us were, were cultural, actually. Um, I had a long discussion with Dan Doktorov about this um, from Sidewalk Labs. He was the former um, deputy mayor in, of New York and in the, in the Bloomberg administration. And uh, what we, we came up with in the end is that this whole smart di city discourse and um, the challenges we are facing is a cultural conflict between technologists and urbanists. Technologists who believe in the brighter future through radical digitalization and, and all the benefits of technology. Um, and in part, it's right, because I think for to save the world, we need radical digitalization with and all that comes with it. On the other hand, you have urbanists who are deeply analog in their thinking um, uh, and think sort of they are deeply rooted in the past from, from experience and sort of sort of try to, um, to bring their past ideas into the future, um, but it doesn't work. And these two groups don't share a common language. They are completely incompatible. And part of our work for the last 10 years was to mediate. So I was a mediator, I was an interpreter between these worlds. Um, what we've achieved, I think, is, is um, I shouldn't praise my, my own. So, but I, I think at, at least it's, um, it's interesting. <laughs> um, so we have developed a new energy system, uh, which is in, in, sort of in, incredibly sustainable. We have um, animal aided design concepts uh, to increase biodiversity in the city. We have the sponge city concept where sort of we don't have any drainage anymore. We keep all the water in the district. Um, materiality, wood, of course, is the, the most prominent, but we had other topics as well. So we, we and, and the most, sort of staggering thing was probably my, my constant conflict with architects. Um, oh good, this, you're but, doing my panel for me because then <laughs> we'll know where we know where we're gonna ping pong, right? The, we're gonna go, we're yeah, gonna go straight no, back for you till then, get ready. Yeah, because architects typically come from the object and the bigger the object is the better. Um, as an urbanist, you have to think about the space between the objects. Right between sort of what happens in the public space. space. Correct. Yeah. And that's how we designed the whole project in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, never mind. So, okay. so far to the cultural, I could go on for hours. Tell on, but now you're going to have to lay into this exactly, but in this entire piece about, you know, what is there a conflict here? And then how does that play out when we're thinking about what sustainability needs to mean in the next 18 years or before between now and 2040? I would say there's a there's a kind of transformation going on with the architects at the moment, and th there is a conflict, and there still is a conflict, absolutely. But um, I must say, the architects now have selected their new president, who is a landscape architect and urban planner. She is the president of our federal chamber of architects, having all architects, because they see 
something needs to change. And they see we cannot look at the building individually. We have to look at the whole district, the whole area. I mean, this, this Backfabrik is a great example of great architecture, I find, and heritage and, and identity. And it's, of course, about the whole quarter. So there, there is a, a, a change in thinking, and especially with the Spanish city and all of these ideas, um, that's, that's totally clear that now we have to have green roofs plus um, photo, uh, solar panels on top of the green roof because one gives the shades to the, to, the, to the green and the green cools the solar panels and all of that. So there are many, many more ideas coming up now, but um, it's still a long process. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, so I'm just monitoring the architects and looking at the architects, and, I, and I'm still amazed. Um, it, it takes a lot of time from, from the university to bring up these new generations now. Um, last sentence, uh, deans of architecture tell me now, architects came to them or, or students came to them in the early years and say, I wanna be a star architect. Nowadays, the students come and say, I wanna save the world. So there is a change, but it's taking some time. So solving problems. Elizabeth, you want to come in? We'll go back to Andrea. Uh, yes, I want to come in. Um, I'm coming in from a civil society perspective. And um, I'm asking myself, or I'm observing uh, in, in the last years of my work, as well, I'm having been on, um, well, real estate summits with real estate uh, developers and, um, and, and as well, I'm discussing with um, architects. And even there's a, a big gap between these different sectors of the idea of the, the architecture realize um, aesthetics with it which is really important if we compare um, um, hundred years before aesthetics was were more much more important than today there, there's a different shape of what we're seeing as a nice a nice house or a compact dense house or the real estate developer um, which who is gaining for profit and um, has a different um, objective and um, um, to realize um, a, a, the, the space which is used and which is owned maybe by a city or by a private investor. So there, even there, we have to compare um, different um, aims of um, stakeholders. But from the civil society perspective, I'm asking myself, okay, a city and Berlin is a good example. There are different spots and um, of great examples. And we have seen that um, with Philip and uh, Nara. Nara. Um, they showed these great examples, but all are fragmented. But how can we get and how can the city come together yeah. and be still um, accessible? Accessible, and we have to think, and that's the role of the urban planner, to think, um, it in a holistic way, like transport, how people move, what can technology do? We have many innovations and we have many ideas, but how can the technology really address the need of the people? Mm -hmm. And comparing this, for example, one last comparison um, to, to US, um, we have seen um, Ali Lipman told that um, um, large cities which are built um, really outer um, yes the american legacy of sprawl yeah mm -hmm. the american city of sprawl and they're big commuters and american love their car they never would to convince them to go to public transport uh, to take a bicycle that would has will something take to years. do with the size of milk containers and that's my new right. theory by the way yeah so starting with the human getting to the to um to to a point um seeing even culture and values um of people's needs are important to think when we're talking about planning and architecture yeah i asked that question for a reason because um i just moved from the united states i bring up this point about milk cartons because my supermarket in somerville massachusetts about equidistant to my summer my supermarket here in berlin but the first thing i did when i got here is i bought a hacken pasha which of course i didn't own in in Somerville, and that has everything to do with the size of my milk cartons. And I, I mean, but this, this gets, and we're going to go back to Andreas here, but this gets part in part to human design. And what are the products that are designed for humans that I'm consuming at another lever and level that influences how I engage with my space? If I took my hacking pasta to my Somerville supermarket, you know, I'd have to make 15 trips to get the same roughly amount of usage out of the groceries because in America, suburban sprawl and bigness exists because there's Costco. <laughs> and so my point is, you know, I think the reason I raise this cultural component as we think about the, the usefulness of forecasting is because those are the elements in differentiation. I think the comparisons between the three cities are fantastic. 
But then there are the pieces that, you know, all of you in your profession and then us in the policymaking space need to balance against, you know, what we can derive as usefulness. Andreas, mitigation negotiating between these tensions and, and you, you plan to make this a new conversation here in Berlin. So how is the negotiation going? Clear has to be clear. And if you take a position as a civil society advocate, in the sense of Berliners would see a civil society advocate, um, we have to change perspective because your background and we do not know each other and this is not rude in, in any sense, but the perspective on who is um, civil society advocate uh, is different seen in the US and in Berlin and uh, overall how we deal with the situation. And I would say that um, we, we are, uh, there's a long process of discussion of um, how the um, organizations from the architecture and the uh, city planning, like you in a super great role of building from the scratch something new, um, the influences of your three um, perspectives on the city of Berlin can be really be uh, mirrored to the ordinary people from Wedding or from around here. And I'm, I'm so sorry, I have to disagree. This is not a good planning area here, this, Pfeffer, uh, this, um, this building here. I'm so sorry. This is only an elite project, which is not including any person living two streets above from here. This looks nice but it's not uh, prepared for a um, pro proper future use. What and, would you like and, to see? Um, it would take much too long. And this is of course a controversial discussion we could use, but somebody has to disagree. If you say this is positive, what's happening here, I would say no. And it, we could have used the evening tonight to discuss about this building or this area. We didn't, but that's not my fault. And I was invited as as my as a uh, as a head of the advisory board of Stiftung Zukunft Berlin, and um, my my board members will also kick my ass. To, to, what, what I'm talking about here at the moment, but I think the the the, the discussion is it's a little bit broken, and um, uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, I I do not could focus on what our foundation is doing so good for the development of the city. We're focusing on the issues of water, of mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. of uh, um, uh, under uh, educated uh, parts of society, etc. That was not the question I was asked. And, um, but yeah, I'm so sorry. But I want to pick up on a point that I think you rightly made before, which is that, you know, cities are in a crisis moment. And I've, I've said in my writing that, you know, cities are the, the seismographs of crisis because they pick up these changes first. And yes, they're the incubators of solutions, but it's also surfacing this crisis. All of you have talked about the importance of narrative. And I, I, I noticed your point about Munich and Hamburg who have sales pitches that they go out with, right? And they've gone out with, and Berlin has its own, right? Exactly. And so this is what I'm saying. I think this is a really interesting point to pick up on is, you know, where is that narrative broken or where does that still work? And where does a moment of crisis and our colleagues from Los Angeles and Atlanta brought it up. And if you've been listening to American radio uh, over the last two mornings, they've had pieces on urban drought and urban irrigation and novel ideas on urban irrigation systems, exactly on fire, on how we cool down our living space. I mean, those have been on National Public Radio, 8 a.m. in the morning, parts of the main stories. And for many reasons, we have a war in the middle of our continent. Um, you know, that's not been a focus, but beginning to retell the story of human space, human interaction, negotiating between these different interests, means surfacing this narrative. And I think part of that's part of what we've tried to do cumulatively in this, in this discussion we'll continue to do. We're at time. You realize that this could go on for another two hours. 
But we have audience in the room and I want to make sure that if you have things that are burning under your fingernails, as we would say in a badly translated idiom, you get a chance to ask those questions. So go ahead in the back. Uh, we have a microphone for you. Can, can everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so um, I recently attended um, a discussion um, with the um, current um, federal minister transport on the federal level. And while he was talking about, I think his um, mother-in-law, obviously an elderly lady um, who uh, is not able to use uh, public transport because it's too, it's too tough, it's too uh, hard to travel. How do we uh, integrate people um, like, for example, uh, this elderly lady who cannot use public transport using cars and also people whose economic uh, job independence is, um, um, is um, based on using the cars, how, we, how do we integrate these people into the uh, urban um, planning system? I haven't heard that yet. Well, we heard some of that from our colleagues in LA who are thinking about the Aspen system of changing mobility in Los Angeles. But um, Philip, mobility and urban access for those who don't get, maybe not get heard sufficiently at our round tables. In the end, it's all about access. And um, what sort of our philosophy was when we, we started thinking about Schumacher Quartier was um, how to get rid of cars best. You still need cars. Um, so we, we have, um, some garages, high-rise mobility hubs, but we wanna make it unnecessary wherever we can. So you have all modes of transport available. It's always um, group cluster together with public transport. Um, so in the end, you don't need cars anymore. Um, and the whole design of the city of the district is uh, about walkability, mm -hmm. access, activating the ground floor zone, um, having bike lanes, super fast connections between all areas and, and into the city, of course. Um, but most importantly is that you want to cut down on, on traffic, on, on commute. So mixed use is the future, of course. The trouble with city planning, it's always been done two-dimensional. We've got a zoning plan with different colors, you know, and, um, and the world of a planner is flat, like a flat earth. But in reality, a city... Now, for Our most colleagues of from Berlin in the front row, for yeah. those of you who can't see this, are disagreeing. Yeah, disagreeing. So, <laughs> but but the reality is three-dimensional. So um, the new the, the new the new trend is uh, that's coming is kind of the is vertical vertical urban planning. So you are multi-coding in one area on different levels and stuff like that. So it's uh, because we are all planning in three D anyway. So a lot of stuff is happening now. And Les, how do you? break through with this conversation. It, I was surprised by the idea of using this uh, nine euro ticket for public transportation. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one idea um, which I really was thinking, yeah, this could be the solution, including taxi and, uh, and mobility issues for uh, other people who, who are not able to uh, to use pu public transportation. So including in a 20 euro ticket or a nine euro ticket, also the last mile between the, the stopping uh, and using a taxi to the home. Mm -hmm. that, that is a solution which uh, properly would fit all the problems. Mm -hmm. Not the problem that people are not, that they are afraid of using it. And there has to be a lot of education, but that could fit the last, um, 500 meters. Mm. I like this whole point about uh, access. I'm a, I'm a new mother and I half the time I find I can't use public transportation because I can't do anything with my baby carriage. And you know, you just need to break a leg to be very clear on how ha handicapped, unaccessible. And in the United States, you solve that with federal legislation and every architect, every American architect shutters when they're designing their building because they have to put an ADA ramp in it and the ADA ramp ruins the entire design. But that was federal legislation. Um, and, and uh, you know, something that was, was very vehemently put through. 
Tidman, you know, thinking thinking through with your with your colleagues about accessibility that that goes beyond um, maybe what we can already see, and again, the role that forecasting can play in that. Um, are we having the right conversations now, and what do these conversations need to look like in the future? Well, we're having a big initiative for for a long time now with the Behindertenbeauftragte der Bundesregierung, Mr. Dusel, who is who is in charge of barrier-free buildings also and a barrier-free life. And we, we do it with best examples and best practice examples to, to show what's possible. We're educating um, official um, educators and we're educating also administrational staff and everybody, client, public clients, private clients and architects as well, of course, to, to be better at that in urban planning and, and everything. Um, I think we have to find out why Mr. Bissing's mother-in-law exactly doesn't use, use it. Is it because there are no elevators or too, too, too many steps and all that? Because of course, there are all the solutions are there, right. but you're very right. I mean, architects in America are also appalled by sometimes these ramps and all that because they're massive. But we think our policy is actually that, that if you do it good, that is the right way because they're really enforced to do it. And, yes. and that's, of course, it is about sharing. Yeah. and sharing with everybody and it makes for rel human reliability totally. you know it's like can we rely totally. on one another to provide for one yeah. another and yeah. yes they're ugly but yes they work other questions yes go ahead hi uh, i'm paul Dorari. i'm a medical doctor and i would like to bring up a topic that has barely uh, been spoken to tonight it's about healthcare. so um, there's a really interesting research that has been done in Glasgow, has divided all the suburbs of Glasgow, has seen how in the different suburbs, there's actually a different life expectancy of people. So, and it has been used, like people living in the center had a life expectancy that was up to 10 years higher than people living in the suburbs. So the question is, how are in the planning of future cities, how can we actually bring healthcare closer to the people and it's not only a matter of like transport of access. We saw this in COVID, for example, that people not having access to healthcare actually were dying at home alone. So my question is like, how can we bring healthcare closer to the people? And secondly, how can we include healthcare experts in city planning for, of the future? I think it's a fascinating question because the city of um, urban, or in the office of urban mechanics in Boston, that was a huge issue while I was there. And the, it was all about the mobile health clinics. Um, but because it's again, there's a there's a juncture here between federal and local responsibilities on on healthcare and health provision and mobility around that. Who wants to take that? Maybe quickly. Um, one aspect of it is that our construction laws are all about safety and keeping away harm from people. And what you're talking about is, of course, a bigger dimension. Uh, we try to advocate that, for instance, climate change and heat in the in the city and and, and all of that is also affecting safety of people. And that's not in the laws yet. As, a, as lawyer, people would say at the moment, no, this is just that a building doesn't crash down. It's, it's nothing more. And we say climate change is a health issue and we need to address that in construction and we need to change the laws accordingly. So that goes a little bit in the, that direction that also urban planning, of course, can be laid out like that. And it's, it's again about sharing and, and including everybody. And I, th I think in all these crises and pandemic, all things, I hope at least that, that people do come together closer and think about, well, actually the, the, the old lady living outside the city, I, I can relate to that because it could be me as well or something. Elizabeth, and then we'll go down the line. We have one more question in the audience and then we will wrap. Go yeah. ahead. Um, um, maybe um, um, we have to differentiate, and you ju also just mentioned it. Um, is it the, the safety, the health system within the building? Um, uh, um, uh, how, how the street or the, the, the format, the design is made for um, the health system itself? Or is it the care which is accessible to the people in the uh, in certain suburbs or in certain um, districts, and then we're talking about the 15-minute city. Is it accessible um, within the neighborhood, and how can um, uh, is there in every street in every um, super block a doctor, for example, or is there some caring or for elder elderly people? So 
we have to different and that that's mentioned um, the dimension of architecture and design and aesthetics as well how um, the, the haptic is um, um, sought within the planning of healthcare or the accessibility itself. And then I'm thinking about um, the health system on the federal level and the local level. Um, we in Germany, we are really, we, we are really lucky with our health system. In America compared, um, home, um, we have so many homeless people and um, we heard it about LA or just go to Denver or to other cities or uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Um, people are getting homeless because they can't afford their health system. They can't afford and pay off their system. So that's the federal state and that's the governance level and not the local level and the building level itself. That was a little bit um, uh, in the, the same direction to, to uh, challenging the numbers you, you were talking about. People in living in the city getting older than people not in the city. Um, where are these numbers are coming from? How these arguments are um, developing? Because I would think that the uh, suburban environment is also very important in between these two perspectives of how um, living conditions are for people on um, overall life scale situation and um, uh, uh, living in the uh, in the uh, out of the city area cannot be also much more healthier so i think the we, we, we could have a closer discussion about the numbers if it is really like that, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. Well, did you want to weigh in on this and then we'll go to our, we have, oh, I guess we have two more questions we'll do, or three more. We're going to take them so quickly together. We're going to do these last three and we're going to do speed round and then everybody gets to say their last word and then we cap. I take a different angle. Um, the 15 minute city, we've heard it several times uh, today, is so passe, you know, it's so yesterday. Um, I'm propagating the five minute city. Oh, that came you know, up. Yeah, um, and, and uh, sort of the, the five minute city is what we really want because Berlin is a 15 minute city. Uh, Berlin is made up of 94 villages and all of these villages or Kieze have their own infrastructure and shopping and doctors and schools and everything. So we do have the 15 minute um, city, but we have to be more radical. So it's, it's more like the fractal city as I've called it recently. So like the fractal where you go down and sort of you find the form again and again, the Mandelbrot baum, remember that one. So that even in the smallest entity, one block, you should have all functions, mm -hmm. including medical and uh, intuition and so forth. And it's a, I, I'm very fortunate. I live in a five minute city in Charlottenburg. You know, I, I walk five neighbors. minutes. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I walk five minutes to the to the office. I don't need a car. But it's brilliant. I, I love it. OK, we have three questions. We're going to do a speed round. So I'm going to ask you to be communal and pass your microphone to our colleague two rows ahead of you. So we're going to one, two, three, and we're going to take them all together. So starting with you. Um, very quickly, I am a little bit surprised that we don't think a little bit bigger. And I'm with some of the people on the panel. For example, I know Hannah's not here anymore, but I don't really mind too much if I can swim in the spray. I would like to have water in the spray in the next five to 10 years. And I think we, no, we have to think a little bit different in Germany and we have to face reality that life might change where I would like to build a bridge to the US. The US is always criticized for a heavy energy usage, but they have air conditioning in the summer. They have heating in the winter. We do not have air conditioning in the summer. How do we bridge that? Do we think about that in the future? Because otherwise it will be become uh, not livable anymore in cities here in Germany. And the last question more or comment more about digital. We never talked about digital right now. We talked about Hamburg. I spoke to some developers in Hamburg yesterday. They haven't even thought about putting sensors into their new quarters, which are being developed for the next 40 years to actually understand what data you can put out. And then you come to healthcare, because if you put new digital sensors into urinals, you could probably measure the pH weight of urine and so on and ha have completely different solutions. And I think we need to think a little bit different, a little bit long, long term. And I don't it's not a question anymore. I'll pass it on. It's a we're going to we're going to we're going to take up the 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 point about censoring heat dimensions and data management. Okay, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I read a book from 1970, um, and most of the things which are now being um, talked about are written in this book. So it has been 50 years since uh, this book, and um, now we talk about it. You realize we, that's why I asked my first question, whether 10 years or a long time or a short time, yeah. but yes. I'm, I'm waiting for implementation from what has been written 50 years ago. Okay, that's well, yeah. Do it. Um, um, speak, no. We'll circle back, okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, my question is whether oh, pillar, um, pillar language. Okay, language. Great. Um, my question is whether one of you is considering in your projects or your planning any carbon dioxide. Excuse me, carbon dioxide, yeah. CO2 absorbing concrete yeah. or concrete which is uh, procured with CO2, and if not, why? Okay, I think that's fascinating because it ties into the the, the heat components and and what buildings do, which is they generate heat. And when I was working for the mayor, we were had a white roofs campaign. Now we have a green roofs campaign, how we cool the city, how we manage with what we have, because I will bet you we will not have air conditioning in Germany. Um, so we're gonna go to Tim and then I wanna go to Philip on that question. Then we'll take the, we'll finish our round on the CO2 piece and any other components about how long is it really gonna take? So go ahead, Tim. First, this is very easy because this afternoon I spoke at a conference where a new organization is founded of all the concrete manufacturers, how to reduce CO2 in concrete. And there are digital methods already because it's all about the burning process and how to reduce that and how to also reduce the sand in the concrete and how to substitute that with other components and all that, how to substitute the steel in the concrete by carbon and all of this. So there, there is a lot going on the digitalization i would say definitely can work on it um i thought you were talking about the club of rome report from 1972 the limits to growth everything is in there mm -hmm. and yeah it's a totally valid question yep why 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 but i think uh, probably we all know it. it needs a crisis it needs a real crisis it needs a real threat that people wake up i mean we're not helena fisher why now but she has her new song exactly on that so it is it is it is all about um now there's a crisis and now probably there's movement, but it's, it's a valid point. It's nothing new under the earth what we're talking about. Mm. Yes, we've lost 50 years, more or less. Um, I mean, we grew up with uh, these childhood books with all these illustrations of, you know, by 2000 flying cars, everything clean. Um, and it didn't materialize. What I mean, in the in the 80s, we had solar, PV, we had windmills, we had everything, and we knew everything. Um, what happened was the end of the bipolar world. So the wall came down, and um, all of a sudden, the whole discourse changed. And it's actually we've lost 30 years. Let's say 30 years, not 50. Um, and now we are back to where we where we left off in the in the late, late 80s, I'd say. Um, in terms of digital, uh, I'm Mr. Digital anyway, so I'm, I'm sparing that one. Um, but I, I think it's important to um, to have this grander perspective on things. It's it's elemental. I mean, we had to, to the to the heat thing, for instance. We we had all these experiments in in LA with whitening streets with uh, titanium dioxide um, turned out to be cancerous, actually. Um, uh, or the, the white white color is, is pretty expensive, costs so thirty to forty thousand dollars per mile, um, and it's sort of it's military from military research this color, and you have to repaint it every, every five to seven yeah, years. And the much factory. more effective way to cool down streets is trees. So leaf trees, they are the most effective way. You break up the ground, um, you have the trees, and there's nothing better you can do yeah. than that. It's the most effective way. Elizabeth, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes, um, just a short thought, um, because um, you mentioned um, 50 years, we lost 50 years, 30 years, and we, um, we, we, we imagined like flying cars, and we, we still fl imagine flying cars, but is, I'm questioning back, is that what we really want? Does that help to be um, sustainable? No, we, we need to go back to, to the nature. And what is um, the question, what is the, the significance of progress? Fortschritt. Um, it's not the technology and technology improvement 
anymore. It's for what we use technology to go back and to save the planet and even in the cities, um, because cities um, uh, are not um, built only by, by concrete, but they need uh, a human, it's a freezing um, environment. So it's more, we, we need to, to look back to go forward. Just the last input. Um, my most loved word in English language is serendipity. And this is the main enemy of architecture. And the only case of uh, how serendipity and Zufall, Kommissar Zufall würde man in Deutsch sagen, uh, can happen is nature but lead it and guided by rules which are bigger than um, a city planning concept, which is uh, voted by five to four in the city concept. And so it's super clear and we agree, <laughs> um, much more important is to leave trees in the city and open all this concrete shit for nature. Well, I'm going to speak for Aspen, but only as a part of this initiative to say that we are engaging in part and supporting this forecasting initiative so that we know how to ask ourselves the right question and the kind of different people to bring to the table in different kinds of surround. And I think we've really seen that this evening. I think it's been a remarkable, I mean, we've touched so much here. Um, I think this has been a remarkable conversation, which could clearly go on. I want to thank my panelists. I want to thank you for asking engaging questions. I want to thank Stormy for hosting us here and uh, for bringing us all together transatlantically. So thanks to all of you. Be well, be healthy, be safe, be urban. Is there a drink now? Fabulous. Even better. <laughs>